Welcome to Keeping the Lights On. I'm your host, Todd Reed, and on this podcast, I connect with the owners and pros who design, build, and maintain our electrical, communications, and industrial world to explore the best ways forward. In this episode, I welcome Steve LaGiacono, Business Development Manager specializing in industrial lighting applications for Graybar. Steve is one of those people that has so many fascinating things going on in his life. We could spend three separate shows talking about how he's a passionate motorcyclist, collecting, repairing, and riding primarily vintage and European and Japanese bikes, or how he and his wife have traveled the world, including a driving tour of Hungary or rafting in Norway, or even another episode on his 13 years as a Green Beret with 10th Special Forces Group, airborne no less. But today we're going to focus on his work in industrial and healthcare lighting. He is a certified as a lighting professional by NCQLP, a well-certified professional, Naumco certified lighting controls professional, and senior lighting technician. Steve specializes in lighting renovation projects primarily in the industrial and healthcare space, but also undertakes projects in commercial, institutional, and municipal areas. In this episode, we're going to talk about what a plant owner or manager should think about when they begin to work on a lighting renovation project, be it a simple project to light a room, to a complex relighting of the entire plant floor. Let's get into the show. When I started the show, I was going to focus this segment on meals that my guests share with their coworkers, you know, company food traditions that, you know, the office, you know, you go to the same place all the time. But I'm noticing because of the way so many people work nowadays remotely, or in your case, you're always out with customers and kind of working, you know, at their locations all the time. It's becoming more of about just celebrating the foods that are important to you, maybe in your hometown or otherwise. So, Steve, I'm curious if I were to come into town or you had a customer come into town, supplier, where would you take them? Well, probably one of two places. A uh, place most recently that I was at was uh, called Little Hats Italian Market. Uh, it's in Germantown, which is a section of Nashville that's uh, sort of a very old part of town, but becoming somewhat gentrified. But um, uh, Little Hats is a complete Italian deli, all sorts of artisanal uh, Italian food products. And then, of course, the deli. So you can get uh, cold prep foods, uh, all kinds of Italian sandwiches. It's, uh, it's pretty great. Plus, you can sit outside. Oh, that's nice. What, how did you discover it? A friend of mine had mentioned it and uh, decided to go check it out. It was the site of uh, actually a fish market before. Wow. Uh, but they recently opened up a few months ago, and it's, uh, it's great. It's absolutely awesome. Is it a fairly new place? or Yeah, relatively new. Okay. Relatively new. <laughs> So what would you recommend I get and or what is your favorite thing to get there? Uh, probably the traditional Italian uh, sub, uh, which is just uh, capicola, salami, mortadella, with Italian dressing, obviously. That's, and it's a hot sub, so it's, uh, it's just great. Just one of my favorites. Is it one of those places that always has a long line? Like you need to get there early for lunch? I'm just curious. Yeah, Saturday's t- tough. Yeah, but during the week, really, it's really not too bad. So you know, typically you'll have a you know a ten minute wait. But yeah, it's definitely worth the wait. Cool. Well, now I'm gonna have to get to Nashville and go to uh, Little Hats, right? Little Hats. Absolutely, Little Hats Italian Market. Yeah, that sounds great. All right. Well, let's get into you know why we have you here today, uh, Steve. So. A lot of the things that those people serve are made in some sort of factory or, you know, facility that's, uh, even though there are a lot of handmade stuff, I'm sure they have some stuff there that's made in a factory. And well, and that's kind of where I think you spend a lot of your time, right, is in industrial plants, could be food bev, could be any kind of, uh, you know, manufacturing facility, if I understand correctly. And they call you because they have a lighting problem. Can you tell me, you, you mentioned when we were talking earlier that your role is kind of like a doctor seeing a patient and trying to, you know, trying to figure out why they don't feel good. How, how is it similar in that way? <laughs> it's, well, good analogy. But typically, uh, you know, industrial customers especially will have, you know, any number of issues occurring. Uh, primarily, it's too dark. It could be an older building, uh, typically industrial plants, uh, you know, are 30 to 40 years old at a minimum. Uh, some are even older than that. I was at one in um, Baltimore uh, just a couple of weeks ago that uh, was a blockhouse constructed in about 1900. So it's uh, over, obviously over 100 years old, but uh, it's, you know, low light. I mean, manufacturing personnel, hard time uh, maintaining equipment, seeing product, 
picking product. So it's it's low light. I mean, that's that's kind of the number one problem. Second problem is uh, could be dirty power as an example, which is causing maintenance issues with existing lighting systems. And then third, and obviously a primary concern of industrial customers really is uh, employee safety. So, you know, looking to make sure that they're uh, mitigating trip hazards, mitigating uh, accidental injuries on the job uh, by providing obviously better light. So those are the biggies. So I have some uh, ties in with the lighting world, uh, being married to a designer myself. So, but, and I hear about this. And so you can let me know if this happens in, in the, the world you work in too. A lot of times um, customers will self-medicate to keep that medical analogy going. Right. So what are some of the errors that happen in that, that self-medication? You know? uh, the biggest one is uh, probably wrong color temperature, number one. You know, the, in an area that needs uh, 5,000K uh, correlated color temperature, they'll be putting in 3,500K. Uh, only because the person selecting the lighting, usually from a big box retail store, uh, didn't pick the right box. Uh, the second one is it's just the wrong fixture. It's the wrong fixture, the wrong lighting distribution. It's just the wrong placement for a particular area of manufacturing or any kind of process, like a motorway, as an example, or an aisle. So those are good examples of, of those types of facilities kind of you know, self-medicating. Do you have any other examples of uh, some of the challenges you come across, uh, you know, specific or uh, kind of plants and what you were running across? As a matter of fact, just this week, I was at an office building in, let's just say, Philadelphia. And <laughs> it's like, because if I say the exact location, they're probably going to figure out who it was. But it was in <laughs> Philadelphia. And I uh, ran across one of the offices that actually had a, a sheet over the two by four fixture that was in the ceiling. Obviously to kind of limit or, or filter the light actually coming out of that fixture because apparently it was too bright. So rather than installing the correct fixture in that office environment or even putting a dimmer on the wall, they decided to put a sheet over the fixture. And I've seen that repeatedly. I've seen people put colored sheets over fixtures. Hmm. Matter of fact, I've posted those on LinkedIn. So, uh, yeah, you see all kinds of weird stuff out there. Yeah, I will mention to the listeners that uh, Steve does post a lot of interesting pictures from the jobs he's walking, which is kind of cool. Just kind of gives you a before effect. And I assume, you know, this is funny. I don't know if I've seen them, but I'm sure you post after photos as well. But I see a lot of the pre's and those are, he's very good. He doesn't tell where he is or anything, but it, it's it's interesting, and that's the colored sheet is very funny. <laughs> yeah, those are uh, yeah, those it definitely happens more often than it than it actually should. <laughs> so, well, you know, and I, I think part of it probably is you know I can see it in a plant or something. There, you know, everywhere there's budget limitations, and someone says we need to fix this, so they're like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll put a sheet over it. Okay, so you know, from you know a layman's perspective, it, it seems like. And I don't spend any time in industrial plants, honestly. Most of my time is spent in commercial spaces and retail and things. And it seems like most people have converted to LED. So it seems like it, how big a problem is this? I mean, what, and what's the problem out there? It's still a very sizable problem. Uh, according to uh, many of our uh, strategic supplier lighting manufacturers, I mean, there's still about 85 billion square feet that has not been converted to LED. So, and I'm sure... Now, you get in your car and you drive to work and, you know, maybe if it's dusk or, or still dark when you're driving in the morning and you see kind of those yellowish uh, lights on the side of a building, that's that's a pretty good clue that that building has not been converted. And it's just kind of shocking walking into some of these especially large facilities like distribution centers that they're still running off uh, you know, fluorescence from metal halides, which are really kind of energy hogs. Well, so, okay, so there's a lot of people that still need to fix it. And it's not, from what I'm gathering, it's not just about just converting to LED. I mean, that's relatively easy, right? Because that's pretty much what you can buy nowadays for the most right. part. So I think the problem gets a little deeper than that. We'll get into that a little bit later. But I do want to start out with kind of like, so for the listener, like what's next? Like kind of what's your vision for, is for the future of lighting? Like just, I don't know, just a few years down the road, where do you think either we're going or you think you'd like to see it going? I think the future of uh, lighting in uh, actually any commercial or industrial or even residential space is where all the lighting uh, is controlled granularly. And what I mean by that is you control every single fixture individually. Your control zones uh, become virtual 
So in other words, if I'm in a manufacturing plant and I change my process layout, in other words, if I've got a line of one type of manufacturer here and I want to move it to another part of the plant, I don't have to rewire the plant to change my zones. I can just do it from my iPhone or my iPad. So, you know, eliminating the element of human interaction from lighting. In other words, the lighting, the scenes are controlled automatically. When you walk into a room, the lights come on. When you leave the room, the lights go off. Lighting is uh, dimmed down to a particular level when uh, just automatically you've got lots of daylight harvesting. So I, I think the adoption of controls throughout a facility and granular controls with controls on every single fixture is definitely the future of lighting. Have you helped with a location that's kind of starting to move that direction? A couple of them, actually. And um, it makes a huge difference with regard to um, uh, particularly energy savings. Because uh, as an example, uh, in an industrial plant I worked at, we installed granular controls throughout the facility. And the lights are uh, pushed up to 100% when the first shift comes in. 90 minutes into that shift, they dim the lights down to 85%. So automatically, that's 15% savings off the top with no visible perceptible difference in the level of illumination throughout that plant. When the first shift leaves, the lights go back up to 100%. Second shift starts, 90 minutes after the second shift starts, the lights go back down 85%. Again, no visible difference in in the level of light uh, for the workers on the, the manufacturing floor and so on and so forth. So companies can save the you know, up to 55% more on energy consumption by the adoption of uh, controls, number one, but secondly, granular controls. It just makes a huge difference. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And so that all happens automatically, right? They've programmed that. Okay. And it can be programmed from your, literally from your phone. So it's great. Right. Yeah, that's, that's good. So someone's concerned about their lighting, you know, from as simple as it's too dark to energy or who knows a myriad of other reasons. But what's one of the first things that they need to ask themselves as they start to look at a, you know, at the, a, lot of, at a lighting project? As a customer, I think it's, it's going to become fairly evident that my building's too dark. So, you know, that visible indication that uh, there should be more light in this space. Uh, I think that's probably number one. The second reason would be they want to save money on energy consumption. So they realize that they're, Electric bills throughout their plant or their whole enterprise or their office building are kind of getting out of control. I don't know of anybody whose electrical bill has ever gone down. So that's probably number the number two indicator. And then number three uh, reason really is uh, I want to be more green conscious. Uh, I want to lower my carbon footprint. I want to, you know, plant tree seedlings and save gasoline, take cars off the road. So doing that is is also something we're starting to see more and more throughout uh, the U.S., which is great. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so they realize their problem, but now what's the first question they should ask themselves to start looking for that right lighting solution? What is my intent for the space? And it can differ greatly with uh, any type of space that you're actually looking at. Obviously, a museum is going to be quite different than commercial office building or an art gallery is going to be different than an industrial space or a large, you know, commercial, let's say a uh, gathering place is going to be a whole lot different than a hospital. So is it a, is it a lobby space that uh, I want to light, you know, correctly and create layer, a layered lighting environment that's very attractive and sort of to create an impression when you enter that space and then, obviously, uh, tune lighting specifically to, you know, whatever the, the owner's intent is for each individual space throughout that facility. Uh, it's a bigger concern for office buildings, as an example, as opposed to industrial spaces where they have, you know, large open spaces. Or is um, focused task lighting something you see in the industrial space? Yes, all the time. With auto manufacturers, as an example, or OEM manufacturers that supply auto manufacturers with parts. They have very specific quality standards that uh, they have to adhere to. So having uh, sufficient task lighting at inspection tables, at uh, QA tables, at individual workstations, uh, it's absolutely critical. Did a transmission plant a few years ago uh, that supplies... uh, transmissions for a Mercedes, BMW, and Volkswagen. So obviously, dealing with very small parts, 
very, you know, fine part assembly with, you know, lots of assembly components, it's really important that uh, those manufacturers and those workers have sufficient light to be able to meet those high quality standards. Okay, I'm about to ask a question that I know um, I'm playing a little devil's advocate here, but I see it myself and I'm not even a lighting expert, right? But well, isn't the solution just more light? No, <laughs> it's, it's not. Ask anyone who's, who's sat in an office building with the, the, wrong, the wrong light above their head. You know, you can't, can't create what's called in the industry a glare bomb where it creates lots and lots of visual discomfort. And we have tools to actually measure that glare factor. So you have to be very careful uh, in order to create uh, the right light with a very comfortable distribution and brightness for the person that's at that particular station, as an example. Okay. So you, you, you start to understand the intent of the space, like what are they trying to achieve? What's their business goals or whatever? Kind of start mm-hmm. to figure that out, you know, and obviously you kind of figure out, okay, well, how much light do you need? But what are some of the other things you could talk about? You've, you've brought up lighting controls, color temp. I feel like you mentioned something else. Can you just touch a little bit more on like some of the things that they can start thinking about, you know, with those two, maybe those two subjects and maybe others that maybe people don't think about when they think, you know, about lighting? Uh, well, controls is probably the first thing they don't think about with lighting. You know, the light's just there <laughs> and you turn it on and off. So that is, uh, you know, the wall switch, you know, the on and off wall switch is the ultimate, very fundamental lighting control. It turns on, it has two states on and off, but people don't think about daylight harvesting as an example. Mm. So I can maintain equal levels of light throughout the facility with, you know, let's say lots of window walls throughout the entire day. Uh, People don't think about circadian entrainment for, you know, workers to be able to, that has a biological or a pathological effect on occupants of the space to help sleep cycles, you know, mitigate, you know, lots of what we call blue light. So those are all sort of concepts that are being brought into the, the lighting renovation world in particular that, you know, typically a customer won't think of. I'm going to have to ask you to maybe talk a little bit about circadian, did you say entrainment? Yes. So what is, what is that? Can you touch on that a little bit? So, you know, we all have a, an awake sleep cycle. And circadian entrainment, really, very simply is, you know, you sort of wake up in the morning, the sunlight color is uh, sort of more reddish that allows us to, uh, the body to actually become more awake, more vigorous. You have the brightest light, you know, around noon, typically varies from wherever you live. And then in the afternoon, as it gets towards dusk, the light color temperature then, rather than become bluest at noon, becomes uh, more red during, you know, dusk and and twilight uh, until nightfall. So it sort of creates a, it's difficult to explain without a picture, but it actually, it helps the body metabolically just react more naturally to the built environment. I think that's the the best way I can say it. So it's more concerned about the occupants of the space as opposed to just, you know, blowing the place out with tons of light with no consideration of color. Okay. You know, that's interesting. I have heard about, you know, this sort of thing, especially in schools for kids as they learn. And, Mm -hmm. but what's interesting to me is thinking about that just for, you know, people that are in that factory, 40 plus hours a week. And that's, so it's interesting kind of setting that tone. So it's more natural for them, you know, as they work. And I assume it helps them be more productive and be a little bit more in rhythm to their body. At its foundation. Yes. Is, you know, does the science sort of substantiate all that? There's been a number of uh, studies that have been completed that, that actually uh, are able to mimic that. But as the scientists will tell you, still a little bit early, but it definitely does have an impact. Budgeting is always an issue for any sort of project and any, any business of any size. Are there any studies and measurements on, you know, return on investment type of things you know, based on? With uh, every project that we do, we provide a, a 10-year life cycle cost analysis, which is really an industry standard. We'll provide the uh, project uh, return on investment, the internal rate of return, and the project net present values so that a controller or a CFO or, uh, you know, your accounting person in your office can easily 
compare that lighting renovation project to, let's say, you know, another CapEx project, like, you know, buying a new chiller or getting new dumpsters or whatever it is that they do. So it's a very easy basis for them to fundamentally grasp the value of that project. Well, I'm assuming that those reports don't talk about the impact, either financial or soft uh, savings or improvements with culture, productivity, health, that sort of thing, right? Because you can't really claim that. Right. We try and stay away from, uh, and I know the people at Well are going to get mad at me, but we try and stay away from soft dollar comparisons because they're intangibles. They're difficult for customers to uh, actually grasp. Uh, We provide with all of our uh, proposals, actually all the formulas that we use to calculate uh, energy savings, to do all of our financial calculations, to calculate their BTU savings, converting to LED on reducing HVAC loads. Uh, So all of that is very easy for customers to, you know, not only grasp, but they're they're hard numbers. It's all math. Right. There's a lot of things to do in every every location that you visit. There are similarities. There's lots of little details and things, and I'm sure that make you know each problem unique. But you know, we'll we'll put ways on contacting Steve and uh, at the end of the show. But so I do want to close out, Steve. You know, refocusing on the why of what you do. You know, what motivates you to do this day in and day out? What keeps you excited and passionate about what you do? Employment, number one. Hmm, interesting. Okay. <laughs> so, Good. Every facility offers its own unique challenges, uh, whether it's an industrial plant or a commercial office or a hospital, a physical therapy clinic in a strip mall, a retail store. They're all different. And I think that provides the uniqueness. It's, it's refreshing to sort of view all of the problems that the unique problems that these facilities kind of bring to the table and what we can do as an organization to uh, help them meet those problems with effective and and value-based solutions. That sounds like a great commercial, doesn't it? It does. Let me clip that, uh, you know, (laughs) and we'll we'll post that on the social media there. Good job reading the uh, script there. Just kidding. All right. Well, that's, that's great. I know, you know, like I said, I'm married to a lighting designer and every space we walk into, she's craning your head and looking up into the lighting every single space. Mm-hmm. So now I do it. So that's uh, uh, something she did. That's called the lighting nerd effect. Yes, <laughs> and nice. definitely definitely that. Um, but it's a, it's a good thing I support that. All right. Well, Steve, thank you so much for being here. It's been great uh, having you on the show. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. That was my conversation with Steve LaGiacono, business development manager specializing in industrial lighting applications for Gray Bar. You can connect with Steve and what he is working on by heading to the links in the show notes. Now, here's what stood out to me from our conversation. One, when thinking about a project, the place to start with is the intent of the space. You know, what am I trying to accomplish? What are my, the people working on in that space and how does it dictate how it should be lit? Two, the importance of color temperature a new new words I learned, circadian entrainment, and the huge benefit of looking at controls beyond a simple switch and moving to more sophisticated controls that are more granular and can help me achieve my business goals as well as potentially helping provide a healthier environment for the team working in that space. Oh yeah, and number three, more light isn't necessarily the answer to my lighting problems. If you enjoyed this episode, you can help us grow this show by leaving a five-star rating in your favorite podcast player and even writing us a review in Apple Podcasts. So thank you so much for listening to this episode of Keeping the Lights On. We'll see you next time.